So atrial fibrillation is one of the most serious and also unfortunately one of the most common cardiac rhythm disorders that physicians see. Cardiologists have to deal with this problem all the time. It's common in people who are older. It's also seen in people who are younger. Atrial fibrillation is the result of the upper chamber of the heart just quivering. Ordinarily, during the normal sequence of activation of the heart, the upper chamber beats once and sends blood to the lower chamber, the ventricles, and then they beat once. And this happy sequence continues for most patients about 100,000 times a day. The heart beats and the two chambers talk to each other continuously. The atria beats, then the ventricles beat. With atrial fibrillation, the rhythm in the atria becomes disorganized and the atria just starts to quiver. The actual rate in the atria is over 500 beats a minute, but because it's so fast, all you see if you were to look at the upper chamber is it just sort of quivers. And when it quivers, it doesn't send uh, blood to the lower chamber as it should. And the lower chamber sort of beats irregularly. So if a patient has atrial fibrillation, if they take their pulse, they'll find that it's irregular. That's all over the place. And because of this, when patients with atrial fibrillation try and do things, they'll oftentimes have symptoms. The symptoms can be palpitations, can be shortness of breath, can be a feeling of it's like a fish flopping around in a patient's chest. And those can all cause a, patient's to, a patient to have lifestyle problems. They have difficulty exercising, they have difficulty sleeping, they just feel ill at ease when they have atrial fibrillation. And those life lifestyle symptoms are you know, an issue for patients, but the biggest issue for physicians is the fact that the upper chamber is really not moving blood with atrial fibrillation, just quivering. And when blood doesn't move, blood clots. And so as the upper chamber quivers, par par parts of the upper chamber can form clots, and if these clots break off, they go to the lower chamber, and then that blood gets pumped out into the body and can cause a stroke or a peripheral embolism. Either way, it's a bad problem with atrial fibrillation. And patients with atrial fibrillation, many of them at least, not all of them, but many of these patients need long-term anticoagulant therapy, long-term blood thinners to prevent, prevent strokes and clots and, and the other issues we see with atrial fibrillation. And so the issues with atrial fibrillation are that if you treat it, you're replacing one problem with another. The issues with anticoagulation are bleeding and, and a lot of other issues, including interactions with other medications. And patients need to be on these medications for life if they have atrial fibrillation. And in addition, they still have the symptoms of atrial fibrillation, palpitations, shortness of breath, difficulty with exertion, while they're on blood thinning medications. One of the things that we can do with atrial fibrillation patients is we can put them on antiarrhythmic drugs on rhythm control medications. The problem with those types of treatments is that, again, you're replacing one problem with another. Even if medications work, and they only work in about half the patients, but even if they work, the patients need to be on these medications for life. The medications oftentimes have systemic side effects. They can slow the pulse. Some of these medications can have fatal side effects, and some of the side effects can accumulate with time for some of these medications we use. And, and you end up replacing one problem with another for many patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, including the issues of the, of the potentially fatal side effects that many of these medications have, and the fact that they only work for about half the patients. And because of the issues with anticoagulation, and because of the issues with treating patients with medications, and because of the issues that both of those therapies are lifelong and the patients oftentimes still have atrial fibrillation and the symptoms associated with atrial fibrillation, catheter ablation is now available for many patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, if we're going to do a catheter ablation for somebody with atrial fibrillation, we would like the patient to at least have tried an antiarrhythmic drug and shown that a simple treatment doesn't work. As I said, for many patients with atrial fibrillation, antiarrhythmic drugs don't work or they have side effects, and for at least half the patients, probably for more than half the patients, in fact, the simple treatments don't work, but it's worth a try for most people. If the simple treatments don't work, and if the patient's still symptomatic with atrial fibrillation, then there are things we can do which can potentially cure people of their atrial fibrillation. And the thing that we've been doing uh, for about the past uh, almost 15 years now in electrophysiology that really has been a major advance in the field of, of, of of treatment for heart rhythm disorders is catheter ablation. With catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, the areas in the upper chamber that are actually causing the fibrillation, the areas that are actually driving the rhythm disorder, are found and are eliminated. And when you do this, you can oftentimes cure a patient of their problem. And in many patients, this is a permanent cure. 
and if they are found to be cured permanently, many of these patients can stop all of their medications that they previously were taking for atrial fibrillation, including anticoagulant therapy in many patients and antiarrhythmic therapy. Now, catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation is, has not been a perfect science. It has worked for many patients, but the problem is for many patients you'll do an ablation and the patient will initially be fixed or will initially have a good result, but then a few weeks later, a few months later, the atrial fibrillation comes back. And the reason why that occurs in most patients is because of something called reconduction. And what that means is that the areas that you have ablated, that you have eliminated, were only stunned during the ablation procedure and were not permanently eliminated. And the problem for electrophysiologists is it's difficult for us to tell at the time of a procedure whether or not we've actually destroyed the tissue permanently or only stunned it and prevent it from conducting electricity, electrical signals, acutely during the procedure. And unfortunately, you can't leave a patient on an electrophysiology you know, on the table here for a week to wait to see if you've just stunned the tissue. So you have to stop the procedure and hope you have actually permanently eliminated the abnormal tissue that's causing a atrial fibrillation. But for many patients in the past, that wasn't the case. For about a third of the patients we previously did ablations on, uh, they would have to have a second procedure. Repeat procedures, unfortunately, for atrial fibrillation are, are a fact of life. One of the reasons why they're a fact of life, that you have to repeat procedures in order to fix patients with atrial fibrillation is because you have to be careful when you do an ablation that you don't put too much pressure on the heart. Because if you put too much pressure on the heart, you could potentially have complications like damage to collateral structures near the heart. There are a lot of sensitive structures near the heart you wouldn't want to ablate, so you don't want to put too much pressure in the area. And you also don't want to increase the, the um, power of the ablation catheters to the extent that you're also going to heat collateral structures and potentially damage them. So until recently, we have had to be very careful when we do ablations that we just do enough, hoping we fixed it and actually acutely we'll see interruption of electrical conduction, but has it been permanent is the question we have had. And because of this, this issue, about a third of the patients, as I said, who have, had, who have undergone ablations for atrial fibrillation will need to have a repeat procedure. So now we have a solution which, which appears to decrease significantly the number of repeat procedures that are needed and increases the ability to cure the patient permanently with a single procedure. And that is a technology called force sensing, force sensing. So, when we do an ablation for atrial fibrillation, one of the things we're looking to do is to eliminate certain areas of the heart. For example, in this particular patient, this is the right upper pulmonary vein, atrial fibrillation tends to occur from the structures of the heart where the blood is drained from the lungs into the heart. So this area here is where atrial fibrillation tends to occur. And there's four of them or five of them depending on the patient, but those are the areas where atrial fibrillation tends to come from, the areas that drain blood from the lungs into the heart. And so the idea with the ablation is to sort of put that structure in jail, to put a fence around it. And what happens in the pulmonary vein, when you're done, you put a fence around it, should stay in the vein. So if atrial fibrillation starts here, it can't get into the heart and the patient stays in normal rhythm. You have put that area in jail, that bad area that's causing AFib, and the patient's heart stays in normal rhythm. And if you're successful, it should be a permanent fix for most patients. But as I said, the issue is that how do you know you're not just stunning tissue? And that acutely you seem to have isolated this, this area electrically, but then a week or so later the abnormal rhythm recurs because you've only stunned the area and reconduction has occurred. And one of the major advances in this field over the past year has been force sensing. When we used to do ablations for atrial fibrillation, we'd put a catheter on the tissue, we'd use x-ray, and we'd use this three-dimensional mapping system we have here. And we would find the areas we need to ablate, we create ablations around those areas, and we would see electrical signals on our screen, and we'd think we were ablating those areas. We'd think we were touching tissue, but the problem is until about a year ago, you didn't know for sure if you were touching tissue, and you didn't know for sure if you were touching it hard or touching it softly. In fact, you could potentially just be floating on top of the heart and see a very nice electrical signal, but you're not actually touching the tissue with the catheter. And it's sort of like, uh, I like trying to, uh, uh, a good analogy might be like trying to, uh, to solder something with a soldering iron. If the soldering iron is just above the area you're trying to solder, you could be there all day and you could see what looks good when you're looking at it visually, but unless you're touching it, you're not going to solder something. And it's the same thing here. Until recently, 
You could be above the area you were trying to ablate to see a good electrical signal and think you were ablating it, but only be delivering a minimal amount of energy to that tissue. Alternatively, you could be touching the tissue very hard and not know it and think you were safely ablating when in fact you're delivering a lot of force to the tissue, potentially heating and, and causing damage to a collateral structure near the heart. Because of this in the past we've had to be very careful how we ablate. If anything, my preference, and I think the preference of most patients is that it's better not to have a complication, and our complication rate is well under 1% for these procedures, but my philosophy is it's always better not to have a complication if we don't succeed you know, we can go back and we could do another procedure. Better to be safe than sorry. And so in the past we had to be quite careful with what we did. Now things have changed dramatically now that we have force sensing. The way force sensing works, I have a catheter here which it's going to, without magnification, I'll see if I can, perhaps we can get some icon, some uh, cartoons just showing this in, in greater detail. But the way it works is there's a very, very precision sensitive spring that actually can sense the force you're applying to the tip of the catheter in three-dimensional space. So in that direction, in that direction, and, and in that direction. Okay, so I'm sorry, in that direction. So in the X, Y, and Z axis, you can actually sense the force. And when I do a case later, you'll actually be able to see there is a force vector, which our three-dimensional mapping system will show. It'll show us whether we're pushing on the tissue hard, whether we're pushing on it soft, or whether we're not touching it at all. By knowing how much force we're delivering to the tissue when we turn the heat on in a blade, we will know if we in fact are delivering a good quality ablation to that spot. And this has been proven clinically to significantly decrease the need for repeat procedures. The other thing, and this is a three-dimensional electroanatomical electro map, it's a three-dimensional map. We use a GPS system that lets us create a model of the patient's heart and know exactly where we are and where we've been. And the other thing that we now have is something called VisiTag. And the way VisiTag works is the computer here will not actually place an ablation tag. And all these uh, pink and, and, and red dots here are ablation tags for this particular patient. But if you just touch the tissue for a second, and you have the right type of force, and you have the right power settings, but you only touch it for a second, that's not an ablation. The tissue has not been eliminated. It's just been touched. So the way this system works with VisiTech is you actually have to be on the tissue with the right amount of force for the right amount of time. And then the computer actually places a tag there. So this is not done by somebody manually. The computer is actually saying, Dr. Fischel, you have created a high fidelity ablation at that site. That site now should be eliminated and that elimination of the abnormal tissue should be for good. So now between force sensing and the ability of the computer to also integrate the force and the time and place a tag when both of them have been achieved, force and time, in that spot when the power is on, you now have a high fidelity ablation. And this type of technology has significantly increased our ability to fix atrial fibrillation with a single procedure and also made the procedure safer. And this is a major thing for me as a physician. There are very few things in medicine where you both have increased efficacy and increased safety. For a lot of procedures, well, yeah, we can fix more patients with this procedure, but there are more complications if we try that procedure. Or, oh, this procedure is much safer, but you don't fix as many patients. But with this technology, we have achieved both. And to me, that is a major advance in the field of electrophysiology. We now have a higher success rate with a single ablation procedure and have a lower risk of complications because we know whether we're not touching at all or whether we're touching too hard with our catheter was what do the different colors mean? And actually what they are referring to, it's a technical thing, but since I know a lot of the people who watch these videos online are fairly interested in the technology behind this, those, that's called a force time interval. And that's displayed up here. The white is, is, is the minimum we'll take in the force time interval. And it won't display anything unless you have achieved what we consider to be a good quality ablation. But if there's a spot that typically has thicker pieces of muscle like the front, this is actually the front wall of, of, the, um, of, of the left atria here, okay, even though it, it doesn't look that way, that's actually the front wall. That area is near an area called Bachman's Bundle. It tends to have thicker pieces of muscle there. We'll stay on that spot longer. And instead of giving us a pink dot, it'll give us a red dot. The pink will slowly become red as we're doing the ablation because we have stayed on that spot for a longer time with adequate force. So the different colors mean mean you have a good ablation but some of them may be a little longer than others. Now there's a downside to staying onto a spot too long because as I said you have to worry about collateral damage. But this technology now gives you something you can measure. 
you know if you have the force. You know if you have too much force. You know if you don't have enough force, and you know how much time. And this is really good because it tells you, yes, you have a good ablation, or yes, you have a really good one here. Uh, so this is an, a catheter ablation. Uh, this, this is an ablation catheter, excuse me. And you can see how it's steerable, how I can move it back and forth with my right hand. I can have, actually have a thumb control I can use to move it. And this is actually a very, very, very sophisticated piece of medical equipment. And um, what we're going to do today is a catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, basically from start to finish. So I just want to tell patients this is basically for the most part, a very easy procedure for somebody with experience to do, although it is something that requires a doctor who has done a number of these. I don't think you'd want to go to a doctor who does these sort of as a sideline. The, um, the way we do these ablations is we put little tubes in, they're sort of like IVs, that we put into the veins in the leg. The veins in the leg are very large. Uh, could you lock the door there, please? Good. Let's start again. The way we do these procedures is we put uh, little tubes in called sheets. These are put into the veins and the legs. We put a few of them in. And you can see that basically it's a very small little tube. And it goes into the vein and the leg. And from these sheets, we can actually put catheters. These are basically electrical wires through the tube and up into the heart of the patient. And then when we're in the heart, we can record electrical signals. We can do our mapping and we can do our ablation and eliminate the abnormal tissues that cause atrial fibrillation. All right, so I'm going to start by putting the tubes in the leg of the patient, and then I'm going to put the catheters in, and then we're going to do our map, a three-dimensional map, and then from there we're going to do our ablation. Uh, today, thank you. Today we're um, using a technology which I talked about in another segment called force sensing. And the way this technology works is it actually can measure the actual force that the catheter is pushing on the tissue. So unlike the old days, which were about a year ago, we now actually know whether we're actually floating on tissue or touching it. We know how hard we're touching it, and we know whether we're touching it enough or touching it too hard. So when we do the ablation, we will know if we actually have good contact with the tissue, and that's what you need to get a good ablation. We want to eliminate certain abnormal areas that are causing atrial fibrillation, and the problem until recently has been that you really didn't know if you were really had good contact and how hard the contact was, and you need that. If you don't have that, patients can have a recurrence because you've only stunned the areas, and then the atrial fibrillation comes back. Okay? So, you ready? Yeah. Let's get started. By the way, this is Steve Eglinton, one of our fantastic nurses here. Uh, we, have, uh, we have Jay over there. We have Michelle over there. We have our anesthetist in the back. We have an entire crew of people dedicated to doing this case from start to finish safely and effectively. And that's, by the way, the other thing that you need if you see a doctor and you have an ablation. You want to not just have the doctor, you want to have the facility. You want to have the mapping equipment. You want to have all the safety precautions that we typically take that are in place. You want to be in a place that has open heart surgery, although we have never in my career ever needed to use it. We want to have that in case there is some type of complication. You want to be ready for it. And really, the, the other thing we need is we need a, a crew of people who are technically experienced, who know the equipment I need, who know how the procedure's done, because it's not just me. It's all the other people here, including the gentleman behind us, who you'll see in a second, Mike Driver, who works for Biosense Webster, who is going to help us with our mapping today. All right? So, ready to get started? Let's get started. So you can see it's very easy for me to put these tubes in the patient here. There's only a little needle stick. It takes me about a minute to put each side to e put the tubes in. And we'll typically use both groins in the patient. It's just easier on the patient if they have the, the catheters in both sides rather than one side. Thank you. Okay, so Steve, you can just hold a little pressure here for a second, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hold some pressure there. So the tubes are in the right side. 
and we're going to put another two tubes in the left side. Now, physicians will sometimes put a number of different catheters in, and it depends on who you go to and their experience and their comfort level, but they'll sometimes put in ultrasound catheters and other types of mapping catheters. Our philosophy is we'll use those if we need to, but we try and minimize the trauma to the patient. So for most of the cases I do, we'll usually just put in four sheets, okay, for a mapping and reference catheters and a prayer ablation catheter. All right, so I'm going to put another two in on the left side now. Really very easy to put these things in. It only takes about a second. So this is basically the extent of the trauma that the patient has, which is, you know, at least for their groin is four needle sticks. The nice thing about this is also these are in the vein. They typically heal very well without a score and with only a little bit of a bruise, which goes away in two to two to four weeks after the ablation procedure. You can let go, Steve, that's fine. And these are such small tubes, you sometimes have to wiggle them a little bit to get them into the skin. Anyway, they're in. And so now we have completed, basically, the surgical portion of this ablation procedure. There's no, going to be no additional punctures or cutting or anything to this patient. We're done with that. Everything else is going to be in putting catheters in and actually finding the areas in the heart where the abnormal rhythm's coming from and fixing those abnormal areas. So we do need to use a little bit of x-ray, but not a lot, to put our catheters in. So could we um, lower the lights, please? Lower the lights there, please? Michelle? It's Michelle Rogers, our excellent electrophysiology nurse. And Michelle, could you move the uh, monitors a little closer to me, please? So here's our, this is one of our catheters. It's a quadrupolar catheter. This is going to go into the right atria. And you're going to see, I'm going to x-ray in a second, you'll see on the x-ray, particular patient has a pacemaker defibrillator. Okay with the, NG? the NG is good. What Jay is doing is she's actually putting some x-ray dye into the esophagus of this particular patient to make sure that uh, we are careful with the esophagus, which is one of the structures we want to be careful about when we do an ablation. So if you look at the x-ray, you'll see this. That's good, Jay. You can pull it out. She's putting some x-ray dye in. It's a safety precaution, and really safety is number one to us. We want to try and be as safe as possible when we do these ablations. I'm going to put another reference catheter into the heart. Now this is a 10 electrode catheter, but you can see how small this catheter is. It's sort of, <laughs> it's a little, it's sort of like a thick hair, the size of it. So this is, you know, minimally traumatic for most patients having these things in. They just have, you know, four tiny little holes in the veins of the leg. They're basically big IVs. And when you pull them out, you know, Patients can usually go home. For many patients, we can send them home the, the same day even, and they can go to, back to work the next, but since we're using a general anesthesia, we usually keep people overnight just to be on the safe side in case they have any side effects from the anesthetic or from the ablation or anything else, although typically that's not an issue for most of our patients. Okay, very good. So that is in the coronary sinus, this catheter, which is one of the veins in the heart. And now we are ready to go over to the left side of the heart, which is where atrial fibrillation comes from. So I have to change this little tube for a longer tube. i do that right now. Move the monitors a little bit closer, please. Very good, thank you. So what Steve is doing is he's loading a sheath. It's a long sheath, same size as the other one, just longer. So you're going to need that because this entire tube is going into the heart, okay? What does each lead do? So the leads on the left side of the groin are reference and pacing catheters. This allows us to pace the heart and to sense electrical signals from the heart. 
So that's what we have on the left side of the groin. And we need those in order to pace and sense while we're doing the ablation. The sheets on the right side and the electrodes on the right side, one of them is used for mapping to create a map. And I'm going to show you that in a couple of minutes, how we actually create a three-dimensional model of the patient's heart. And the other one is a catheter we use for ablation to eliminate the abnormal tissues that are causing atrial fibrillation. Okay, you can pull that out, Steve. So what I'm going to do now is something called a transeptal catheterization. Now, this sort of sounds a little scary to a lot of patients because in order to fix atrial fibrillation, we have to go into the left side of the heart. So we have to make a little puncture between the right side and the left side to get into the left side. But the fact of the matter is the heart is basically just a giant blood vessel. And whenever you put an IV in or, or, or do any type of operation involving the vas vascular system of a patient, you need to put a little bit of a hole in a blood vessel, and these little holes will typically heal. And this is typically a very routine and not a very difficult procedure for us to do for the vast majority of patients. It only takes us a second to do. So it sort of sounds scary, but if it's done with experienced hands, it's not an issue. And we always check to be sure we're in the right spot. I'm doing that right now, which I am. And so that is the extent of our first transeptal, what we just did here. I'm going to give some heparin to the patient to make sure the blood stays thin. Since we're now in the arterial side of the heart, we want to make sure everything stays anticoagulated here. So that's our first transeptal. We have to do two of them. And we'll see. Okay. The PFO there. I'm just give me the sheet. This particular patient has a relatively common anomaly of his heart is that in that he has already a small hole in his intraatrial septum that's present in about 15% of the population. And it, nicely for us, the wire we're using to actually get into the left atrium just went across the hole, so I don't actually have to make a puncture, a second puncture in the heart. He already has one naturally. That's present, by the way, in 100% of people when they're in the uterus, when they're babies, because the developing heart needs that hole to provide oxygen to the body, but it typically seals as people get older, but it's easy for us to get across. So anyway, now we have both, I need the heparin, please. Yep. Now we have both sheets in the left atria. These are the transeptals. You can see how hard it is. It's really not that hard in experienced hands to do a transeptal. It only takes a couple of minutes, and it's quite a safe thing to do, you know, in experienced hands. Now, in inexperienced hands, you, you know, I'm not sure you would want, a patient wouldn't want this done because we are purposely making a small hole in the heart. If that hole is made in the wrong portion of the heart, you know, you can have some issues. So we typically don't have any issues. You know, we do, this particular facility does well over 500 of these transeptals a year, and we've never had any issues that are really serious with, with the vast majority, if not all of our patients, as far as this, this particular procedure goes. All right, so now we're gonna put, we're done with all of our sheath access. We have two sheaths in the left side of the heart. We have our wires in, uh, for reference and pacing in the right side of the heart. Now we're gonna start doing some mapping, and this particular catheter is a circular mapping catheter. You can see how the circle I can steer, okay, and I can move it back and forth also. I can tighten the circle, or loosen the circle. And we're going to use this to actually help draw the anatomy of the heart, to, to reconstruct a 3D model of the heart. So I'm going to put this on the left side of the heart in the left atria now. You see on x-ray, I know, John, if you can look on the x-ray, you can see our, that little circular tube is in the left side of the heart now, as you see up there on the x-ray. Okay. Now, this is our ablation catheter. Now, as I described the other day, this is quite a sophisticated piece of medical equipment. This has numerous different sensors in it. It has the ability to be steered. You can see the catheter, if you look at it, it's sort of crying. You see how it's weeping water? That's from numerous laser-drilled holes at the tip. The, the idea with that 
is that when you're heating the tissue, you don't want the shaft of the catheter to get hot, you don't want blood to clot on it. So it's continuously irrigated as we're doing the ablation. And that way only the tissue deep to the catheter actually gets hot. This particular catheter has a GPS sensor, it uses magnetic fields. So it actually has three magnetic phase sensors built into it. And that's how we can track it in three-dimensional space. We have sort of a constellation of electromagnets under the patient. So that helps us track the catheter. This has two temperature sensors in it. This has irrigation ports in it. It has steering in it. Uh, and it has a force sensor in it. So it can actually measure the force, not only the force in one plane, in all three planes, so we actually get a vector for the force when we're touching tissue. So I'll put this in the heart now. Now my screens here, I'll give you a quick rundown of what I'm looking at on all of these screens in front of me. Okay, very good. Mike. Mike, you want a zero, please? Very good. Could you go up on your title volume, please? Oh, you've done it already. Okay, very good. So let me just give you a quick update of what I'm looking at here, because I'm looking at a number of screens. This is a patient's x-ray. Okay, and you can see there's our ablation catheter here. Here's one of our sheets we've used to get into the left side of the heart. Here's our other sheet, and here's our circular mapping catheter we're going to use to build the heart's anatomy. This screen here shows me the actual electrical signals being recorded from those catheters from the inside of the heart. You have different colors, so it makes it easy for me to look at. Each color represents a different catheter, okay? We have four catheters in the heart. We have four different colors on the screen. This screen in the middle is a very important screen. This is our electroanatomical mapping screen. This screen is gonna show me a three-dimensional picture of the heart and also show me where I need to ablate, where I've been, the quality of the ablation, the force of the ablation, and so this is screen, as we do the case, you're going to see that this sort of green blob we're looking at now is going to start to look like a heart in a second as I start moving catheters around. So what Michael's doing is he has the, the mapping machine set to record anatomy as I move the circular mapping catheter around. And as you can see, if you look at the middle screen and as I'm moving the catheter, we're slowly drawing anatomy. The green blob is becoming it's sort of a bigger blob right now, but in a few minutes it's going to look like a heart, like a left atria. This really only takes a couple of minutes to do to create a three-dimensional map. I don't know, John, if you're looking at the, that green screen, yeah. you can see it's slowly getting bigger as I move the catheter around and it's filling in anatomy. It's sort of like a paintbrush, the way the machinery works. Where you move the catheter, it leaves a trail and slowly fills in the anatomy in three-dimensional space, okay? You can see as I move it, I slowly fill in more of the heart here and its anatomy. And before you know it, we have something which looks like a heart, which doesn't look like it right now, but give us a couple of minutes. But it really only takes a couple of minutes to do this. That's the left lower pulmonary vein there. There's the left upper vein. There's a right upper vein. And here's your right lower here. Okay. Mike, switch to mapping, please. Now I switched my paintbrush because I want to do additional painting with my steerable mapping catheter and ablation catheter. My reference circular catheter is in the right lower pulmonary vein. I'm just going to fill in some additional anatomy here. It only takes a second. And before you know it, we are going to have what looks like a left atria to work with. I'm thinking as a matter of fact, one day, maybe we'll even do a live case with people online, and they can actually ask questions if they like as we're doing the case of uh, what we're doing. You know, there's a lot of patients out there who have atrial fibrillation. It's a very common disorder, and unfortunately for patients, it's also something which can really disrupt their life. It can even result in death from strokes and from bleeding from anticoagulation and from medication side effects. So if you can fix it, it's the best thing. Okay, Mike, you can segment the heart. Now, I gave some heparin, which is a blood thinner earlier, 
since we need to keep, we're in the left side of the heart, the arterial side of the heart with our ablation equipment, we need to keep the blood thin. So we're now going to check something called an activated clotting time to be sure that the patient's blood is thin, but not too thin and not too thick when we do this ablation. Okay, Michelle. Very excellent nurse. Say hello, Michelle. Hello. Well, that's Michelle Rogers. And the nurses we have here, by the way, I have had the pleasure, like Jay Mordash here, of working with for almost two decades. And they are some of the finest nurses I have ever worked with. Most of them have worked in the ICU before. They have a significant experience in critical care and in handling patients who have complex issues. So without them and without Mike, I certainly couldn't do my job well. As a matter of fact, I couldn't do my job at all without them and without Mike. Are you ready, Mike? Okay, so um, I'm going to show you the three-dimensional map here, okay? Now, it's not unusual. You notice I took off my gloves. That's not unusual for us to do during a procedure because we're going back and forth, and this procedure is sort of semi-sterile anyway. But here's a 3D map of the heart. And you can see there are actually four blood vessels that feed blood into the heart. This is the right-sided veins, the right upper and right lower corner vein, left-sided veins, left upper and left lower. And these are the areas where atrial fibrillation tends to come from. It tends to come from the pulmonary veins. So the idea with the ablation is to create a circle around the veins and lock them in jail. So it's sort of like the Las Vegas when you're done. Whatever happens in the veins stays in the veins. And you've created a fence, a barrier between the abnormal tissue that's causing fibrillation and the rest of the heart. Okay? You can see, as you can see, when the patient's breathing, that's our circular mapping catheter I showed you earlier. You can see it's actually moving in the heart as the patient's breathing and as the heart's moving. And our ablation catheter, you really can't see it sort of inside, in the middle of the heart right now. But as we do the ablation, you'll see it. This, set, this uh, number here is the force. The, the ablation catheter is touching something that's showing seven grams of force. Previous to this technology, we didn't know if we were touching anything. We didn't know if there was force or not. All we saw was a signal on it. That didn't tell us that we had good contact or too much contact. So yeah, go to PA, please. Start pacing, 650. You can see my, the staff here, I don't really even have to tell them what I want them to do. We've done so many of these cases. They anticipate what I want, and good nurses and a good team, the nurse knows before the doctor even asks what he or she might want and has it ready. And you can see that the Michelle's sitting there at the, at the pacing and recording system. Mike's sitting there at the mapping system. They know what I'm going to want to do next in order to do, have a good result with this case. Okay. So if you look at the three-dimensional map here, we'll take 20 watts here. There's a white dot there. And there's a little arrow. That's a force vector. It's showing where the force is pointing. It's pointing towards the back wall of the heart. We're like, it's like we're looking at the back wall of the heart now. It's showing nine grams of force. Now I'm gonna to wanna to have 10 in order to get a good ablation. But by moving a little bit, I can get 10. And you can come on here, please, at 20 watts. Okay. Now this particular system has something called VisiTag. And what that means is the machine is not gonna place an ablation point here unless I have enough force with the ablation on for enough time. And there it is, that little pink tag, you see it? That means, that's a real ablation. That means there is a force and time on that spot while the power's on, there's enough force and enough time to actually cause damage to that tissue. And that is what you want during this procedure. You want to eliminate the tissue that's causing atrial fibrillation. Not just stun it, but eliminate it. And here's another one, and you can see what I'm doing here I'm going to basically, it'll become more evident in a second if you watch the map, but basically what I'm going to do is create a circle around the problem spots. What's the problem with too much force or not enough? So uh, the problem with, with too much force is you can see we're near the esophagus here. And um, if we put too much force on it, we can actually damage the esophagus. We take a lot of precautions not to let that happen. But one of the biggest risk factors to damaging the esophagus 
is putting too much force on the heart in this area, tenting the heart into the esophagus, and then you damage the esophagus. We don't want to do that. We want to be careful. You can also potentially, if you really have a lot of force, and it takes a lot, it's not something we ever really saw a lot of even without this, but it can happen. If there's a lot of force, you can perforate the heart with the catheter. By the way, that complication is typically not something that's really that terrible, even though it sounds bad. We can handle it. We're prepared for complications here. And we can handle it typically without having to do open heart surgery or anything. But who wants to have to put a hole in the heart? You don't want to do that. With force sensing, that issue goes away. You know if you have too much force, and you know if you don't have enough. So you can see right now, I have 15 grams of force here. My force vector is pointing back towards the tissue I want to ablate. And you can see I'm slowly creating an ablation line around this problem area to isolate it electrically. So the circle is being placed around the, the, these, these, around these little circles. These little circles are the pulmonary veins. Those are the areas in the heart that drain the lungs of blood. It's not really clear to medical science yet why they're so important for atrial fibrillation. There's some theories about it, but it's not really 100% clear. But what is known is that those are critical areas where atrial fibrillation lives. Where it comes from and where it starts in the majority of patients is the pulmonary veins. The areas, the veins that drain the, the oxygenated blood from the lungs into the heart. So if you can put them in jail, if you can electrically isolate them, which is what we're going to do here, you ha will fix atrial fibrillation in most patients, at least in most patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which means they're in and out of it, you will fix it. Who's not a candidate for the surgery? Well, uh, I think every patient with atrial fibrillation we can look at, Typically, though, we don't like to do this ablation procedure on patients who don't have symptoms. Unless they are, there are other issues, we'd like to see somebody who's having symptoms. Atrial fibrillation tends to be symptomatic in most patients, but not in all of them. If uh, they're asymptomatic, I'm not sure I'd want to do it. The other thing is if they can tolerate antiarrhythmic drugs, rhythm control medications, you may not necessarily have to do this ablation. You know, if a drug works, why, why operate? You know, the thing is, uh, we want to, the, the idea is here is to help the patient's lifestyle, not just, you know, not just life in general, but their lifestyle. And if they find relief with medications, that's great. I would leave them on the meds. The problem is, is that medications only work for about 40% of patients with atrial fibrillation. And the other roughly 60% of patients, they either have a side effect from medications or the medications fail to work and they still have atrial fibrillation. They might not have it as much but they still have atrial fibrillation despite the medications. So that's the, really one of the reasons why this procedure has become so, so, uh, so popular with patients because if they can get fixed, they can get off their antiarrhythmic drugs, they don't have to worry about having palpitations all the time, they feel better because their heart's in normal rhythm all the time, anticoagulants can oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes be stopped in many patients. And so it's really a great thing for somebody's lifestyle. You have a tent there, Mike. Calipurize, please, on the PVs. Recovery time. Well, so you'll see this patient, this procedure is going to take you about another, a little over another hour to do. We're then going to want to wait a while and make sure we didn't just stun the spots. By the way, the nice thing about this particular technology is that this de the fact that you can measure force decreases the chances that you will actually have just stunned tissue. If you actually get this tag, you see the machine's putting these tags here. I'm not doing it. Mike is not doing it, the operator of the machine. He's just m rotating the map. The computer is waiting to see that the catheter has been on the tissue for a certain amount of force at a certain amount of time before it actually places a tag there. Okay? And, and anyway, uh, the, the, the idea with this is that if you can decrease the amount, that's good, Mike, thank you. If you can decrease the amount of, of areas that are just stunned, you will have a patient who will be cured with a single ablation procedure. Unfortunately, what is it? Huh? Okay, very good, thank you. I'll give another 2,000 in a second. Unfortunately, it was a fact of life until recently. Go to the roof, please. It was a fact of life until recently that patients with atrial fibrillation, if you did an ablation on them, would have to have repeat procedures about a third of the time. And one of the reasons why is because you just didn't know if you were actually destroying tissue or just temporarily stunning it. With this technology, you actually sort of know. Do, have you actually destroyed the tissue or, instead of just stunned it? 
as far as, re as, far as recovery time goes, this patient's going to be woken up about 15 minutes after I'm done. They'll wake him from anesthesia. He's going to need a lie flat for a few hours because these tiny little holes in his vein are going to need to heal up. He'll be able to walk around later today. We'll watch him overnight, make sure he doesn't have any more AFib, make sure he doesn't have any complaints, make sure he's stable. And if he is, he'll go home in the morning and I'll see him in six weeks. As far as activity goes, usually we tell patients to take it easy for a couple of days, uh, not to, you know, engage in any strenuous activity, you know, lifting of luggage or, you know, as far as they can go back to work usually a couple of days later, but we wouldn't recommend any strenuous activity for, you know, three or four days. And then three or four days post-ablation, if they want to do their, all their usual stuff, that's not an issue. And, and I'll tell you, I'll contrast that with some of the other procedures, such like the MAZE procedure, which is an open-heart surgical procedure for atrial fibrillation. That procedure, the patient, you know, can be hospitalized sometimes for over a week. There's a lot of complications from that, some of which are very, very serious. I mean, there's complications from this also, don't get me wrong, if this is done by an inexperienced operator, you're going to have, it's going to have very, very serious complications from an ablation procedure also. You need an operator who knows how to do this and has experience and can recognize an ablation. If they get it, can treat it, okay? What percentage of patients that have had this procedure done have to come and have a redone? Well, it used to be, come off, it used to be about a third of the patients we'd have to do twice. With, with this new technology, with the force sensing and the visi tag, the visual tagging, come on here, please, 30 watts. That's ex it, it's much less, okay? The recent clinical trial shows it's about 85% of the patients who have this done with Visitag will have a cure of their atrial fibrillation, for paroxysmal AFib at least, okay? It's about 80, 85 percent of the patients with a single procedure are fixed versus about 65, 70 percent of patients, uh, come off please, fam there please, 65, 70 percent of patients with the old technology. So the ability to sense force is really great because it does two things for us, it improves safety and it improves success. And that's really a great thing for me to have both a safer procedure and a more successful one and eliminate repeat procedures. So here you can see I'm going to do this area here now. This is the front wall of the, end of the veins. veins. You can see we have 16 grams of force. We're pointing towards the front wall. Come on, please. Yep. These yellow signals on the screen, on the, on the left lower screen in front of me, are... Uh, signals from the circular catheter we have in the right lower pulmonary vein. And when we're done isolating these veins, you're going to see that they're going to either not be existent at all or be, uh, be dissociated, not have anything to do with the other signals in the heart because we'll have disconnected that structure from the rest of the patient, which is what we want to do. We want to eliminate the abnormal structure. Sort of like somebody has appendicitis, we want to take out the appendix because that's causing the problem. And with atrial fibrillation, the thing that causes the problem in these patients is the pulmonary veins, and you want to eliminate them from any, anything to do with the rest of the heart. So you're going to see there's another tag. So just watch my ablation catheter. Just go to spin to the right a little bit, Mike, on your map. There you go. You can see how it's growing ablation lesions as I ablate. The lesions are growing there, and I move it slightly. I'm going to move it slightly more inferior here. And it's going to grow another lesion in a second. Okay? It won't grow a lesion, won't display one, unless I've been on that spot, but with a certain amount of force for a certain amount of time. As far as I'm concerned, that's a real ablation, okay? So is this just a single circle you're drawing on this patient? Or on that, one so there's two sets of veins. And our plan with this particular patient was paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. is to basically to do two big circles around both sets of veins. And when we're done, both sets of veins should be in jail. And if they're in jail, we're done. So the procedure usually takes, you know, from start to finish, you know, I'm teaching here and we're talking, but it usually takes about two hours to do, okay? Which I think is really fantastic if we can fix something which has been a lifetime of problems for a patient in two hours, you know, two to three hours, you've really done that patient a great service, you know? Right lateral in the sub view, please. What I'm telling Michael is to go to different views for me because I need to see the different views of the heart. And there's a couple of spots they still need to get, a couple of bald areas, you know, that I want to get. And being 53, I know all about bald areas, so I don't want to have them if possible. I'm going to see if I can eliminate them here. There's a tent there, Mike. So some of the tissue was tented. On the, yeah, there you go. 
and he's going to eliminate that. So you see, this particular model of the heart, that's good, that's good, you're good. This particular model of the heart was individualized, there's still a little bit of a tent there. It was individualized for this patient's anatomy, okay? So like, <laughs> not all shoes fit. These are custom shoes. That's good, Mike, that'll work, that'll work. You know, we've made custom shoes for this patient's heart here, okay? <laughs> so this is, cu this is a, custom, a custom fitting we have here. So what is Mike doing and how is it helping you? Well, so he basically is making sure the anatomy is correct, and he's moving the heart to the cardiac map for me. So I'm going to ask him to move to right lateral now. Right lateral. You see how we move the map? So I can see, because, you know, this is a three-dimensional structure. I need to look at it in 3D, and since my hands are already full, uh, I need Mike's help for this. Now I'll show you one other thing. Stop ablating here. Now you look, if you look at the force sensing here, it's 19 grams. Now I can make it higher. I'm going to do that since we're not on ablation. Okay. You see how the screen's flashing? See how the screen's flashing around saying 54 grams? It's safe, by the way, for the patient. 54 grams if you don't have ablation on. But I wouldn't want to ablate with that because you could damage a collateral structure. I just want to show the safety feature of the system. And a year ago, we didn't know whether we had 54 grams or no grams. And now we know. How can you beat this? You have safety and improved efficacy. For me, I like that. I think patients do too. How many facilities are using this technology and how many in Florida? Well, I know we were the first in Florida. I don't know. Go to PA, please. I don't know offhand who has it now, but I'll tell you, I think everybody should have it. Move your caliper to the right, please. If they're not using it, I think it's doing the patient a disservice. If you could say that from the beginning, we have to be the first in Florida. Yeah. We are the first in Florida to, to have a busy tag and to have force sensing. As far as I'm concerned, if somebody's not using it, I, I don't understand why they wouldn't use it. This is safer and more effective. Does it take more work? Yes. You need to have a little more skill to do it, a little bit more. Come on here, please. But, but it's safer and more effective. You can avoid complications that you'd otherwise get, and you improve your success rate. So what is not to like about force sensing and, visi and visual tagging of real ablation lesions using the force time interval? I think this is the only way to travel with atrial fibrillation ablations right now. And you know, by the way, that technology, this is a competitive field. You know, and the technology that, 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 that the medical device companies offer the physicians may well change in the future. May well not, this may well not be the best one. And if that's the case, we will change to what's the best for the patients. Go to inferior, please. So you can see I'm slowly completing my circle here. It's really pretty simple. It's sort of like paint by numbers for adults, okay? <laughs> but, but Paint by numbers, needs, you need to be careful. By the way, we have just achieved isolation of that pulmonary vein for what it's worth as we've completed. And he took a, he took a, do, a manual dot there, that blue dot he took there, he manually placed there at the spot of isolation. But as we completed the circle, and we're just going to keep completing it so that there's actually busy tags there so we're not stunned. We haven't just stunned the tissue, we've actually eliminated it. Fam there, please. There you go, very good, very good. So half the, procedure is so half the procedure is done now. The right-sided veins, you can see there's a circle here around the two right-sided veins. And as we completed the circle, or as we almost completed it, the actual conduction, go down to 20 watts, in the veins went away. It shows a patient this really isn't that hard a procedure for them to have, okay? You know, they do need a general anesthetic. You, you know, you don't have to have that, by the way. Some operators don't use it. We think they're, it's more comfortable for the patient if they're asleep completely. And I also think I don't want them moving at all because it could change how this map looks if they move a little bit. And I need to have precision. This is all about precision doing this procedure. Good amount of the pre precise movements of the catheter, good force of the catheter. It's all precision movements, you know. I, mean, I think that's true, by the way, for anything in medicine that you succeed at. You know, precision is the key to success. That's true probably for most things in life, I guess, you know. So you can see I'm just sort of completing the circle here. Do people come to see you from around the country or where do they travel? Yeah, I have, I get a lot of patients who come from, from all, around, all around Florida and I, I get, I would say, 
about 10 percent of my patients come from other areas of the country from outside the state you know they've been treated they've been treated with medications or uh or, or anti you know or, or attempted ablation or something like that atrial fibrillation they're still having a problem and uh i end up seeing them most patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation i could tell you most of them we can fix okay that's not true for all of them but for the majority of them we can fix them with with a, with a with an ablation procedure like this, okay? They can be fixed, okay? What causes atrial So atrial fibrillation, it's not really known the cause of atrial fibrillation, but what seems to be a common factor for many patients is stretching of the tissues in the atria, okay? And the things that stretch tissues in the atria are things like high blood pressure or leaking heart valve. Uh, high blood pressure is a very common thing we'll see in a lot of patients, but leaking heart valves also are common. For some patients, you don't have an answer. They have lone atrial fibrillation, it's called, and there's just no, no, no take a point there, please. There's just no answer. I don't know, why is it not busy tagging there? That's good. Give me one second, John. Uh, delete that point, please. Delete the point you took. There you go, very good, Mike. Now we have a busy tag. Give me one second here. Mike, right, we'll complete this. So, so, yeah, so to get back to the question, why do patients have atrial fibrillation? Well, it seems to be that stretching of the atria is an important component of it. And the pulmonary veins, which, are, which drain blood from the lungs, are, are very important in causing AFib. And maybe one of the reasons stretch causes AFib in those structures is because they're very thin structures to begin with. That's just speculation on my part. The pulmonary veins are, very, are thinner than most other t tissues in, in the left atria, and so they probably stretch first. And if you stretch a cell, you know, there's basically, it's basically sort of like a little battery, every heart cell, okay? And, and if you stretch it, the, uh, the cell membrane starts to leak. And if it starts to leak, the cells can start to fire, okay? So is that why atrial fibrillation tends to occur from the pulmonary veins? I don't know. Is that why higher pressures in the left atria and stretching in the left atria causes atrial fibrillation? I don't know. But I can tell you that that's a common thing to see, that the pulmonary veins cause it and that there's something in the past come off there's something in the past, some type of stretching that's causing the AFib in patients. So we have now completed half of this procedure while I've been talking to you folks, okay? And if you uh, look at the map here, Mike, could you mesh that map, please? Uh, yeah, that's good, very good. Now rotate it to the right, septally. To the right, septally, there you go. You see our circle? These are not points he drew there. That's what the computer says is a real ablation. Okay, and these are the veins in my catheter, my, my ablation catheter, you can see is sort of floating. See, I'm moving it. The ablation catheter, you see it's floating. Out. Now it's outside in the vein. See, it's outside of the vein here. And here, zoom in on the ablation catheter on the right side, Mike, or on the left side, I don't care. Just zoom in on it as much as you can. Show you how sensitive this equipment is. Look at the shaft of the catheter here. It's floating in the pulmonary vein. If I rotate the ablation catheter, See, it actually shows the rotation of the catheter. You see the colors move, okay? Rotating in the other direction, you see that? And if I bend it, it shows it bending. And it shows the force of the catheter. You see the force vector there? That's the force sensor we're seeing there, okay? Now, it looks like there's a space between that circle. Is that a space? That's the inside of the veins. So that's where the veins lead, and I'm actually in a vein now, and the circle is around it, okay? How do you know that? Well, uh, that's where we, we I, could, I know it because we did a three-dimensional map. And when we drew the heart's anatomy, our circular mapping catheter was touching the outside here. So the inside has to be uh, tissue free, okay? So we know we're in the blood pool, basically, and we're inside a vein. Now, if I look on my x-ray here, you can see I'm out in the vein here. I'm outside of the heart, okay? So let me show you something else here. Sit down here. This yellow, the yellow oh, signals here, okay, and I'll show the circular mapping catheter for you, okay? And we'll do the other side. It's going very well, by the way. So the yellow set of signals here are from the pulmonary veins, from the right lower pulmonary vein. You see the signals here, the signals here, there's no signals there. And the reason there's no signals there is because we have isolated the vein with the ablation. 
that vein has been put in jail. So none of the electrical signals from the heart can actually get into the vein. If you look at the start of the case, though, did we mark it? We marked it, right? No? Yeah, good, here. If you look at the start of the case, or during the procedure, I should say, here are signals. Yellow signals, pulmonary vein conduction, and as we're doing the ablation, this is where we got isolation, someplace along here. This is a review screen, okay, of, of during the procedure. As we're doing the ablation, see if we can find where we got isolation. Here it is. Oops. Yeah, I know. Let me find it. Okay. So here's the signals, pulmonary vein potential, pulmonary vein potential. There's some noise there, no vein potential, no vein potential, no vein potential. That's noise, okay? So I'm going to eliminate that one to make it easier for you folks to see. No vein potential, no vein potential, no vein potential. As we're pacing, you can see here. Here's the vein potentials here, and as we got isolation of the vein, they went away. Three vein potentials, no vein potentials. That vein has been put in jail. Okay, and it is, and that, by the way, this signal here represents this catheter floating in the right lower pulmonary vein. And this entire conduit, the right pulmonary vein conduit, I call it, has now been isolated. Okay, it's now, everything there has now been put in jail.